Welcome to the Cozen Podcast, produced in partnership with Ed Circuit Media, an organization focused entirely on the K-20 ed tech industry and empowering the voices that can provide guidance and expertise in facilitating the appropriate usage of digital technology in education. Ed Circuit elevates the voices of today's innovative thought leaders and ed experts. COSIN represents over 13 million students in districts and educational institutions nationwide and continues to grow as a powerful and influential voice in K-12 education. This high profile series showcases industry thought leaders and executives who provide timely market insights and critical guidance on various educational technology strategies. Welcome to the Cozen Podcast. My name is Jeff Angle, and on behalf of Cozen and today's sponsor, Infosys, we are excited to bring you part two of a three-part series on K-12 education and cybersecurity. In this episode, we will discuss the rise of digitization. Joining me today are Shariar Kaze and Vishal Salvi. Shariar is a seasoned IT executive with over 36 years of experience in the private and public education industry. He was the chief information officer of the nation's second largest school district, the Los Angeles Unified School District, or LAUSD, where he directed over 700 employees and managed a budget of over $350 million. While at LAUSD, he successfully completed a large portfolio of IT projects, including the district's network infrastructure and systems modernization, enterprise reporting and dashboards, student information system, and the SAP Enterprise Resourcing Planning System. After retiring from LAUSD, Kaze founded Macaw Consulting, which provides strategic and management consulting services to school districts, nonprofit organizations, for-profit companies in the education sector across the United States. His expertise commands all facets of the IT organization, including strategy, infrastructure, budgeting, human resources, customer support, and training. Kazai was named CTO of the Year by the Council of Great City Schools in 2014 and is currently a peer reviewer and federal funds optimization task force member for the organization. In 2021, he joined the board of directors at the Consortium of School Networking, or COSIN. Shariar has a BS in mechanical engineering from Washington State University. And welcome to the podcast, Shariar. Thank you. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. <laughs> also joining us is uh, Vishal Salvi. Vishal is a senior vice president and chief information security officer and head of the cybersecurity practice at Infosys. He's responsible for the overall information and cybersecurity strategy and its implementation across the Infosys group. He's additionally responsible for the cybersecurity business delivery, the driving security strategy, delivery, business, and operations, enabling enterprise security and improving their overall cybersecurity posture. Vishal has over 25 years of industry experience in cybersecurity and information technology across various industries. He has extensive management and domain experience in driving transformational cybersecurity programs, delivery and sales, and all key aspects of cybersecurity. Those include policy, standards, procedures, awareness, identity access management, IT GRC, network security, incidents response, security monitoring, malware protection, cyber fraud management, security configuration compliance, online banking, e-commerce, Cryptography, data protection, third-party management, business continuity planning, cyber defense centers, and cloud security. Vishal is a well-known leader in the cybersecurity industry within India, as well as globally, and has been part of the cybersecurity domain for the past two decades. He's a regular speaker at major local and global cybersecurity conferences for sharing best practices and raising cybersecurity awareness across the industry. He is part of various advisory councils and boards, to provide leadership and direction on cybersecurity frameworks and standards to drive adoption of cybersecurity across the industry. He has participated in various case studies related to cybersecurity practices over the past decade. Welcome to the podcast, Vishal. Hey, thank you, Jeff, for having me here. All right, let's be begin today's show by discussing digitization and the impact it has on, on a school district from both, both internally and externally. Shariar, as a former CIO at uh, LAUSD, can you share with our listeners what role digitization has played at a district level over the years? Absolutely. Um, and, and, and this is not just, you know, a, a, scenario, a situation in large school districts. I think all small, uh, medium, urban um, and suburban and remote areas have experienced this and, and most recently as well, uh, even more. 
But in general, um, you know, we started out with uh, back office systems like ERP and SIS for school operations. And slowly, slowly it has grown into our uh, learning management systems and the, you know, for the classroom, uh, huge number of edtech products um, and growing very rapidly, the usage of it in the classroom, uh, the one-on-one -on -one implementations uh, prior to the pandemic and as a result of the pandemic has exponentially increased the uh, technology use in the, in the schools. And then in terms of, uh, uh, and I highlight that even more, the back office, the business operations, uh, transportation, uh, food services and facilities and introducing IOTs uh, into the environment uh, and security cameras uh has has really expanded that uh, uh platform uh the systems are very complex uh, and unfortunately there is a a huge number of legacy systems that exist and we'll talk about that a little bit more and, and how challenging it is but that growth has increased and then on the other side of it the 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 number of users uh and the type of users so you start with back office they're similar very proficient with technology, a smaller group that you could uh, train and, uh, very quickly and they can adapt to change. And then you have this, the school staff uh, and then teachers in classroom, you know, in the classroom, taking attendance online uh, and interacting with learning management systems. And then the students in, uh, with the one-on-one, -on -one, increase of one-on-one -on -one implementations with their own devices or with the district design uh, assigned devices and then eventually the parents who are uh, engaged uh, uh, with with the schools with various various uh, platforms so you can see that the the user base has increased uh, as well uh, quite a bit and so if you look at a school district with 10,000 students you know, you may have had maybe about a you know 500 you know 600 employees uh increasing to uh you uh 10,000 students and then another 10,000 20,000 you know 20,000 parents added to that so all of a sudden you have increased by you know uh 50 fold uh, your user base so it's quite a it's been quite a growth uh, especially in the last uh, few years and and Unfortunately, you know the uh, challenges that has uh, it is exposed is you know whether the IT department has been able to keep up with that growth, and 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 be able to maintain the the posture and the environment adequately. Now that's a great point. You know the the when you look at the a district the size of LAUSD and it really does become exponential progression as you move out from the from the instructional staff, administrative staff, to the students, to the parents. Um, it's got to be a, a challenging environment to, to be able to ring fence that and secure that, that infrastructure. Um, Vishal, anything you'd like to add on this topic? If you look at from the point of view of the, the, the issue of legacy and uh, the, the challenges of you know, being able to cope with the, the rapid digitization and uh, transformation which is happening, clearly, if you look at it from the lens of cybersecurity risks, um, you know it obviously creates a big, big challenge, right? Uh, especially in the background of how we are looking at, you know, the cyber risk and the threats are now indiscriminate. From the time we've started seeing advanced ransomware and advanced malware, uh, you know, the nature of threats have become indiscriminate. They don't target any particular industry, but wherever there are vulnerabilities, there are possible victims who can, could be exploited. And, and, and that, I think, creates an a, a, a additional challenge for schools and universities because of the, uh, the ability to mature in terms of their governance and you know, the ability to drive a cybersecurity program. So, so yeah, I think that needs to be recognized. And uh, you know, there is some uh, work that is required to be done to be able to sort of uh, deal with this rapidly changing uh, threat landscape. Yeah, that's a great point, especially we can talk more about this around the the legacy infrastructure. You know, I had some experience with this during COVID in my school district, where you know we had so few teachers that I filled in for 
a couple of weeks and you know the 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 computer equipment that i had was i think it was a it was a desktop maybe pentium computer and you think about that from trying to be able to secure that patch it it's got to be a challenge all right vishal another question for you how in your view the zero trust architecture that's recently evolved to meet next gen cyber challenges how will how will it be beneficial for the k12 sector yeah so the jeff you know when it comes to the adoption of zero trust architecture you know it's basically something that the cybersecurity world has been adopting for many years uh, we used to call it by different names and uh, in the good old days we used to call it secure by design uh, but as we have started pivoting to cloud and you know the endpoints and the connections have got dispersed the the traditional control of the way in which the organization used to be defined through its perimeter is no longer really applicable and as as that's happened there is a need to sort of look at your extended uh, organization which is pretty much anywhere in the world on the internet and build a similar level of comfort and assurance and for that you would want to adopt a, a concept of zero trust which really means that you can never assume that you are always trusted uh, even if you are trust you know uh, challenged at the at the entrance as you enter the house you would get on ongoing basis challenged to prove your credentials for you to access resources in your um, technology assets so that's really the principle of zero trust and it's a universal uh philosophy which applies to every organization every industry uh, and every geography i think it is uh opportune time for the k12 sector to really look at it because they could leapfrog from the legacy to really adopt the new technologies which are available which are delivering the zero trust architecture like for example getting implementation of the sasi technologies which are modern way of access giving remote access uh proxy access how do we ensure that there is mutual authentication uh you know ensuring data leakage uh prevention and so on and so forth and so there's a lot of consolidation and simplification which is happening to the security architecture and it's a great opportunity for a k12 sector to sort of leapfrog their legacy infrastructure and embrace these new age security solutions which will ensure that you know they are able to sort of build a proper zero trust architecture for their organizations do you know infosys cybernex can defend you against lethal cyber attacks and keep you hyper connected at the same time our platform provides a comprehensive cybersecurity solution to enterprises that otherwise need to invest in dozens of security technologies to attain swift security maturity this is provided by highly skilled security analysts in our specialized globally distributed network of cyber defense center for more information please visit www.infosys.com or write to mitran kurm at infosys.com now that's great and in, in shariar a follow up to that one is um and I'd like you to add to it is from a a large school district like you came from at LAUSD, you know, how do you how would one start to implement zero trust in an infrastructure where you have those legacy systems? I think it needs to be in a kind of a, a phased uh, and and progressive kind of a fashion. Um, all of the districts, you know, as as they develop their uh, strategic plans and the priority initiatives. Uh, I think that needs to be right up up front in the design uh, uh, phase of the of the projects. Uh, if they are procuring uh, uh, any kind of software, uh, those uh, standards need to be uh, incorporated in in those uh, products or required uh, as part of the uh, as part of the terms and conditions that are that are put in place. And I, I, I should say. As as they evaluate products, they need to make sure they're very clear. You know what what uh, requirements they want to demand from the from the vendors. I I don't think it it's something that can happen overnight. It's not something that you could 
established as a, okay, we're going to have a zero trust initiative and just sweep through and try to change everything all at once. You do it phase by phase. So uh, multi-factor authentication, you know, first step. Uh, but some of these legacy systems have been around for quite a long time. Uh, ERPs that, that exist sometimes are 20, 30 years old, believe it or not. And it will take two, three years to, to modernize them. So it has to be done in a, in a, a phased fashion and you know, project by project. But the districts need to have an overall design uh, in mind and, and making sure that uh, they, they have that future architecture uh, in, in place. And then as initiatives are, are uh, uh, planned and, and implemented, they incorporate those standards and requirements into it. Uh, that, that, that I think it's the most uh, kind of a, uh, I think more uh, uh, successful approach than will be a more successful approach rather than trying to take too big a bite up front. Uh, the, the reason I bring this up is the change management process of this. Um, when we talk to the districts, uh, just multi-factor authentication implementation has been quite challenging and they get pushback uh, you know, from, the, from the community of, uh, of users and the population. Uh, it is an you know, extra burden that, ha that has to, uh, you know, for the users. But, uh, but you know, having good communication and taking their time and making sure that um, the, uh, it is, uh, a, you know, the, the reasons behind the implementation, the changes are, 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 are uh, explained thoroughly and justified. Uh, and really have a change management plan around that is is very critical. But uh, we cannot, especially in the school environment, you cannot uh, underestimate the 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 impact that change has uh, on on the in the classroom on the teachers. Uh, their priority, the number one priority, is teaching, and anything that interferes with that and disrupts that is is really. Uh, is just disruptive, uh, and and so you really need to make sure that you communicate really well, and and you really um, uh, justify it, and then time time the changes uh, uh, appropriately. There are certain times of the year that uh, you really do not want to make uh, apply changes or implement changes uh, because it will just create a lot of disruption in the school uh, and in the classroom. Yeah, that's great. And to kind of continue that 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 line of questioning, the ne next question, uh, Shari, is for for you. You know, it's a complex environment within the school and the district between the students, employees, and parents. Um, you talked about kind of balancing the 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 stakeholder experience in terms of timing and not disrupting the classroom. But what are some of the best practices that? you've had or implemented around, you know, the cost effectiveness of implementing these systems and how do you balance that versus kind of the, the government or regulatory environment in which the school resides? Well, I, I think I think a lot of it comes uh, from, you know, being transparent. You know, uh, sometimes the changes are associated with risk and, and the consequences of not uh, complying, and I think security, uh, cybersecurity, and security challenges are, 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 are all related to that. But I think, uh, I think it's uh, being transparent and, and educate the users on why it's important, why it's critical. Um, uh, an example of it is, you know, adopting interoperability standards uh, and, and highlighting how, how it will benefit the, the teachers uh, and the students. Uh, yeah, and, and, and and in addition to providing uh, uh, consistency and uh, more of a stable and secure environment, um, it, I know that uh, a lot of the uh, like educational tech uh, technology apps uh, require teachers to upload the roster, download the roster from SIS, upload the roster into the software, and then create user ID and passwords for their students. And then they have to manage that. And how much time does that take away from instruction? So just uh, being able to explain that if if those stand the interoperability standards are are put in place, the app automatically receives the rosters and the students uh, uh, list uh, from the SIS system in the 
from in the uh, uh, automatically and and how user id and passwords are standardized across the district for teachers and students how much time it will save how secure it will be so it comes with that again that change management strategy uh, making sure that there's clear communication and as I said, timing is a big deal. There are certain times of the year, beginning of school, uh, end of semester, uh, end of year, during the testing cycles. Those are times where you just do not want to disrupt and interrupt. So you have to communicate and you have to uh, schedule it appropriately uh, and being uh, very uh, transparent about it. That's great. And uh, Vishal, anything you'd like to add on this topic? Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to execution and, you know, adoption uh, for universities and K K K-12 uh, colleges is, you know, there are, you need to have a clear uh, approach towards how do you go about looking at managing cybersecurity risks. And I think it starts with building your organization, you know, getting a clear defined organization uh, for cybersecurity, you know, who's accountable for driving and managing cybersecurity risks. The second is about defining uh, clear roles and responsibilities within your organization in terms of uh, how, what is the role that IT is going to play, what is the role that business and uh, school teachers and professors are going to play, um, and, and what is the role that is the admin teams are going to play. And I think that that needs to be defined. And once you've done that, you start really looking at your strategy You know, in terms of what is the operating design. And what are what are the things that you want to really focus on and address to the identified risk for your organization? And the risk could be reputational risk, risk could be disruption, uh, and various other things, and also you know loss of confidential data. Uh, and then you know once you kind of defined designed it, your strategy, then you start really looking at how do you build a framework for a flawless execution of that strategy and design, right? And it requires skills, it requires perseverance, it requires a lot of constant support from senior management and you know, making sure there is proper sponsorship and budgets which have been provided to execute that program. And so the investments part becomes very, very important. And last is, you know, once you've done all of that, you know, security is also about creating awareness, right, amongst all the stakeholders in terms of. Uh, how they need to go about building a cybersecurity culture within your organization, uh, whether it's students, professors, or everybody, every other stakeholder within the ecosystem. How do they, what is the acceptable use policy and how are we ensuring that we reach out to these messages in a very effective manner to all the stakeholders so that they're at least at a minimum aware of what is uh, the right and the wrong thing as far as use of technology is concerned. So. Once you kind of build this, um, you know, approach towards looking at, you know, implementation, then I think, you know, you 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 have a holistic cybersecurity program. Just wanted to add to that, uh, that, you know, um, traditionally cybersecurity uh, is, is uh, left on the uh, table for the IT department to, to uh, be responsible for. And I think it's time that that, that is raised higher to their enterprise le level. And again, that goes back to communication, um, making sure the cabinet, the board members, the superintendent all take ownership. Uh, in LA Unified, we had a whole department called risk management, but their focus was uh, fire insurance uh, for buildings and some of these um, traditional risk management principles. Uh, I think it, and 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 you know uh, most of the uh, school districts across the country they they have some form of emergency preparation plans in place whether it's for uh, you know a fire or earthquake or hurricane or tornadoes there is a great opportunity to be able to take advantage of that uh, structure that's in place and that model that is in place and be able to expand it. Uh, you know, uh, to to do tabletop exercises and include cybersecurity, making sure that the business continuity plans include how the organization is going to each department and organization is going to operate during a a system failure or or some sort of a, a incident, a cybersecurity incident. 
And I think there's, there are opportunities there to bring in groups from outside of IT and collaborate and expand these existing uh, uh, pro uh, pr processes, procedures that are in place uh, and, and piggyback on that. And I think that that can be uh, much easier to uh, to implement than trying to come up with something standalone and brand new. COSA is the premier membership organization designed to meet the needs of K-12 education technology leaders. Their resources support the entire IT infrastructure of the school system. COSA offers members access to their thought leaders across the country and the ability to actively participate in local COSA chapters. Join the network today by visiting COSA.org and become another influential voice in K-12 education. Now, that's a great point and uh, a good segue, Vishal, for the next question for you. Um, how can schools benefit from leveraging integrated security services from an MSS provider rather than, rather than multiple vendors handling various assigned security functions? Yeah, I think, Jeff, uh, you know, what is happening is, you know, security architecture is getting uh, more and more complex. There are multiple uh, tools that you have to choose from. And uh, let's assume that you have selected the right technology, then you have to uh, make sure you have all the necessary budget to acquire it. And then you have, uh, you need people to come and execute and implement it. And then you also need to run it, you know, to provide ongoing value uh, for it. And of course, you know, because uh, there is a high rapid uh, rate of obsolescence, you need to also make sure there's proper uh, focus on capacity planning and ongoing scaling. So all of this, of course, is a, a Herculean task, right? Especially for uh, schools which are not having, uh, you know, that many budgets, right? To to be able to do it all the nine yards. And so I think uh, what's emerging is that you know you can go for this as a service where you can, uh, you know, buy all of the stack powered by content and playbooks and uh, a trained staff to operate it uh, end to end. Uh, so in, what we have been focusing on at Infosys has been to really uh, you know, spend a lot of uh, investments in uh, research and development in building platforms and solutions uh, powered by uh, deep content and visibility of how we are collecting uh, threat intelligence and information uh, from uh, various parts of the world in terms of patient zero and zero day attacks. And then, um, you know, fully automated uh, workflows uh, and playbooks, which are able to then uh, you know, not only contain, but help organization to recover from that. So, and all of this is kind of pre-engineered and pre-packaged uh, to be consumed as a service. So I, our hope and aim is to really make it Make security accessible to uh, all the all the organizations, uh, and also uh, you know make sure that there is a quick time to value. Uh, because with this approach, it's all about just onboarding your technology assets into this um, completely platform-driven solution, and uh, you start getting immediate value uh, because you get deep visibility on what's happening on your network, and then you have the ability to go and monitor and remediate. Uh, the threats and the risks and the vulnerabilities that you're identifying. That's great. Thank you for that. And uh, Shari, our uh, last question for you. Uh, schools are some of the largest employers, but have a scarcity of IT budgets, including that for cybersecurity. Um, what are your industry recommendations for them on their cybersecurity posture, including you know, people, process, technology considerations that they handle or when they handle highly sensitive data in the form of, of PII or financial information? Um, well, in terms of uh, funding, I think it, it's, you know, again, goes back to managing risk and, and the consequences of, of uh, uh, being compromised and, and the cost that the, that the districts have to, uh, bur you know, the burden of that cost uh, to recover. Uh, I think there has been enough examples of it out there uh, uh, to be able to to justify. Challenge is is more recruitment, um, paying the you know being able to pay the the going salary for resources, and that's why kind of going back that, to that integrated security services, 
could could be useful useful there. But but I think it starts with let's let's uh, evaluate where we stand. What is our current you know what is our current state look like, uh, and what is our uh, what does our posture look like? Uh, doing a a full comprehensive assessment, not just a penetration testing. Doing a comprehensive assessment. Uh, physical security, um, uh, you know, an example of it, who has access to the data center and how easy it is to to walk in into the buildings even, uh, and 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 being able to then then uh, report on that and be transparent about it uh, uh, to the cabinet, to the board members, to the superintendent, or where does the district stand in terms of its security posture, and be able to justify the funding. I think uh, uh, the the district a, a, a lot of it is all about education and awareness and and what are the consequences uh, of not uh, protecting the district. Uh, we have uh, uh, medical information about students anywhere, starting with uh, like food allergies all the way to uh, special education services that the district provides. Uh, there's a lot of health information. Uh, the personal information of the students, from employees, even contractors, as you saw as an example in one of the large districts that got hit. So, so I think it's it highlighting that, educating uh, the the decision makers, and be able to justify. And obviously, there are funds available. Uh, uh, hopefully, will become available through the federal government. There are grants available. There are a lot of services that. Uh, that federal government provides the the state agencies are now starting to provide the school districts they provide uh, uh ongoing monitoring uh scanning filtering services and and also remediation you know if if there is a there is an incident that they can come in with their team uh, tiger team to to help and support the district so so there are services available that the districts can benefit from Again, as we as we said earlier, taking the the small steps uh, and slowly, slowly growing, but then uh, being able to educate the decision makers on how critical of a factor this is, and be able to support it. On the other hand, you know, the in in a way, it's kind of the uh, benefit from you know cybersecurity insurance companies are not raising their standards; they're demanding. Uh, more and more from the districts to be able to qualify. Uh, they some of some of them I've heard that recently that they want to do the scanning themselves uh, uh, to uh, to before before insuring the districts. So so uh, those standards have have also the, the demand from the cybersecurity insurances have also now uh, started to to justify and motivate the the districts to be able to uh, to fund uh, uh, the security. Uh, so in in you know you just need to you know uh, uh, try to come up with a strategy uh, and be able to um, uh, to be able to secure the funds. It all starts with education and awareness and and transparency about where the district stands in terms of its security posture. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Vishal, quickly, is there any? Would you like to add anything here? No, I, I agree with what Sharyar has mentioned. I think there is uh, lots to be done and, you know, you need to have a multi-pronged strategy in terms of how you go about uh, addressing this challenge. Uh, but clearly, you know, uh, it, it needs to be prominently identified as a very important aspect of how you're going to manage the future of uh, digital transformation in, in your schools and uh, and have various aspects covered uh, it's not like a siloed approach. You know, you need to have you know aspects related to your strategy in terms of uh, you know what what are the risks to your business and how you're going to handle it. Uh, what kind of investment posture you're going to have? Uh, how do you make it prominent? How do you have leadership uh, forums created? You know, to govern um, and manage the risk and also uh, ability to identify identify risk. A lot of times, what happens is that. Uh, you know the junior people in the organization are uh, who are facing the risk are able to take certain unacceptable risk decisions, and as a result of that, eventually when the risk manifests, you know they they start creating major problem for your organization. So being able to have a governance around 
identification of the risks and bubbling up those risks to the senior leadership so that they can take some uh, right, uh, you know, major decisions on those are very, very important. And then, like I said, you know, then basically you need to really have uh, an execution arm which is then able to, you know, ensure that the strategy that you're put in place is actually getting executed. Well, gentlemen, I, a great conversation today. Uh, it's a you know extremely important topic, especially in light of all the breaches that we've seen in in schools and, and universities over the last couple of years. So, on behalf of Cosin and Infosys, I want to thank you both for your time today, and we look forward to the next discussion. On behalf of the leadership team at Cosin, thank you for listening to this episode of the Cosin Podcast. To access other podcasts in this series, visit cosin.org or edcircuit.com for a complete lineup of engaging technology topics. Ed Circuit empowers the voices of education with hundreds of trusted contributors, change makers, and industry-leading education innovators.